Okay, it is officially 12 o'clock. Uh, so I say, let's go ahead and get started, if that sounds good to all of you who are here today. Um, welcome, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I hope you're doing well today. It's kind of funny to, <laughs> to think that last week we were having an ice storm and then today it's gonna be like 78 degrees outside. But I guess that's, um, that's just Dallas weather for you. Um, so hopefully we'll all get to enjoy some of the nice weather this afternoon. But uh, again, thanks for being here. I am Dr. Allison Boyer. I'm director of the Center for Teaching and Learning here at Collin. Um, and I hope that you are as excited as I am to think about thinking about thinking today as we uh, talk about metacognition and self-regulation in the classroom and, and how that can help our students succeed. Um, I, you know, I imagine we're all here today because we have some sort of awareness that metacognition is absolutely a key factor when it comes to student success. And it is, there's a lot of research that supports that. Um, those of you who attended the spring conference in January and um, watched Dr. Agarwal's uh, keynote presentation, you might recall that she touched on metacognition a bit in her presentation, but really focused primarily on it in terms of um, retrieval practice. So what we're gonna do today is take a step back and think about several facets of metacognition when it comes to student learning and how we can help our students improve those skills um, in our classes and develop kind of just an inclination to want to practice metacognition uh, is a lot of what it comes down to. So the first thing I wanna do before we get started is just do a, a quick poll to gauge what knowledge you all already have or feel like you have when it comes to metacognition and learning. So I, I did create a Zoom poll. Um, I'm gonna launch it right now. So let's just take a few minutes. Again, you're just kind of rating yourself and how you feel about how much you know about these things on a scale from one to five. So go ahead and answer these questions. One being like, I don't have a clue. Five being like, I know all there is to know about these things. Yeah, so we're thinking about how do we feel about if we were asked to ex just explain the concept of metacognition, um, if we were to have to explain the role it plays in learning, and then how well do we feel like we know some teaching strategies that relate to metacognition? Okay, very good. So far, it looks like we are kind of all over the board here, which is good. So yeah. we have some folks who um, seems like, um, I feel like I'm pretty comfortable with this, but um, I feel like I could know a little bit more. Some are kind of middle of the road and then some are, you know what, I, I'm not sure and I am here to learn everything I can. So hopefully there will be something for um, most of you to take away from this, all of you, ideally, um, whether you are just kind of scratching the surface and figuring out what it is in the first place or really fine tuning the knowledge that you already have. So that's great. Okay, I'm gonna, if you didn't answer it, it's fine. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Um, okay, can y'all see the results? I clicked on share results. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see here. So it seems like, again, we're kind of all over the place. So I wanna ponder for a moment how learning happens in the classroom. So we think our students come to our class, 
they do some stuff, right? They listen to a lecture, they do some activities in the classroom, maybe they do a lab or some reading, engage in a discussion. All of that goes into the brain. The brain does some stuff with that information and I am not a neuroscientist, so we're not gonna uh, delve into that right now. But the brain does some stuff with all the stuff that our students just did and then voila, learning, right? Mm, not exactly. Um, there are some other things besides this basic process that can impact whether and to what degree learning occurs for our students. So I wanna pose a question to you all again, and you can just pop your ideas into the chat. What are some factors that you think might impact whether learning occurs or how much learning occurs for our students? Any ideas? about what can play a role in that? Interest, absolutely, Courtney. Yeah, stress for sure. Distractions, mental state, emotional state, 100%. Yeah, whether they've eaten today, for sure. <clears throat> Alice. <clears throat> Knowing why we're doing things. How familiar are they with the topic? Prior knowledge, absolutely. Yeah, how early is the class? Is it right after lunch? Yeah, that's so true, Teddy. Understanding the foundation concepts. Yeah, so many things play a role in what our students are bringing to the learning process. And this is true for, for us too, right? We probably have an idea of, of how um, engaged we're gonna be the minute we um, go to a class or um, how motivated we're feeling at the moment, how much we're able to focus on it. Um, yeah, are they thinking? What kind of relationship do they have with the professor? Um, what are the abilities and skills of the teacher? Absolutely. So as you all are already identifying here, there are so many things that can play a role in the learning that occurs. It's not just what we do um, when we you know, teach our students in the classroom. It's not just about our lecture, right? There are other things that play a role. So it might be distractions, like so many of you mentioned. And that could be anything from what's going on around us at the time. Um, like Alice said, whether they've eaten that morning, it could be what time of day it is. Um, it could be stress, mental state, emotional state, other things that might be happening in their lives that they're bringing with them um, to the classroom, to the learning process. It could also be... Um, that idea of prior knowledge that several people brought up this idea of do they know do they know what they're doing are they unaware that they're doing something wrong and that learning process is just going awry right so how does this relate to metacognition what this has to do is the ability of our students to be self-aware of all of these things that are happening to them, right? Or um, things that they're experiencing and to identify those things and then manage those things, right? Um, is really what metacognition is all about, right? It's this idea of thinking about what's happening and what's going on around them. So that's, that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. So the big question here, how exactly do we define metacognition? Those of you um, who responded to the poll that we did earlier um, and felt like, you know, I have a pretty good sense of what this is. How would you all define metacognition? If you can put some ideas in the chat, that would be great. What does it mean to you when you think about it? Thinking about your own thinking, noticing how you think, yep. I think that's probably what most of us think about when we think about metacognition. That's, that's, um, that's kind of how it all comes together in a nutshell for us. Um, and it's definitely kind of the simplest definition. So here are some slightly more specific um, quote unquote official definitions of metacognition. One's knowledge 
concerning one's own cognitive processes or anything related to them. So again, that idea, awareness of your own thoughts, relating, you know, being um, aware um, of your thinking and of those thinking processes, right? Here's one that's even more specific. Monitoring, controlling, evaluating, and regulating one's thinking and learning processes. And we're going to dig a little bit more deeply into some of these things. But again, in a nutshell, it's that idea of being aware of and thinking about your thinking, right? So before we dive deeper into those specific components of metacognition, I think that this focus certainly begs the question, why does it matter? Why does metacognition matter? Why are we here spending an hour talking about this and thinking about it? You know, in the past, and there might be some of us who still think this way, some might think of learning as kind of an act of banking, right? In which knowledge is kind of just deposited into our students, right? As we discussed a little bit already. Um, but the fact of the matter is, this is not how it works, right? Our, we can't just pour knowledge into our students and they get it. There's much more to it. And activating metacognitive processes is, has been shown to be linked to improved learning, improved thinking skills, and better academic performance because it provides students with more tools for things like critical thinking, problem solving, and thus makes them more adaptable to different environments. Um, it's also been shown, I think this is really interesting, it has also been shown to help students compensate for low ability or lack of relevant prior knowledge, which we talked about already, um, and help students become more flexible, more self-reliant, more productive, more efficient, more independent learners. And those are all the things that we want for our students, right? Uh, conversely, students who are not equipped with significant metacognitive capital have been shown to be at an increased risk of attrition. So again, in a nutshell, when our students are capable of metacognition and inclined to practice it, they do better and they become better, more flexible thinkers. Um, something else that I think is also really, really good to know, metacognition has also been shown to be more durable and general than domain-specific cognitive skills. So in other words, metacognitive skills can be transferred from one domain to the next. So if they learn some metacognitive skills in their biology class, they can take those skills with them to their English class. Um, this can go from math to history, to psychology, to nursing, to welding, to all of these things. So these are very transferable skills. So they are very um, worthwhile to spend time on and beneficial for our students, not only in terms of their academic performance, but for life in general beyond the college classroom. And again, that's kind of what we're aiming for. So in that second definition of metacognition that I shared, um, it listed several basic components of metacognition. So let's take a closer look at those right now. First, we have metacognitive knowledge and awareness. And basically what this means is knowing about stuff, right? So this could be knowledge of general strategies related to metacognition. Um, it could be that knowledge of the self that we've been talking about, knowledge of one's own strengths and weaknesses or the processes they tend to follow. Um, it's also knowledge of how to do things, otherwise known as procedural knowledge, as well as knowledge of when and where to do certain things. So when it's appropriate to use a certain task or use a certain skill, right? Otherwise known as conditional knowledge. So that's, that's kind of a big component, but there's some other pieces as well. The next one is monitoring and evaluating. In other words, the ability and the proclivity to pay attention to your own thinking and your own behavior as well as assessing its effectiveness. 
So um, it's like knowing, recognizing that you don't understand something, having that awareness of what's happening and, and being able to evaluate how well it's going, right? And then finally, we have directing and regulating. And that means using the information gathered from the self-monitoring and the self-evaluation to manage and adjust one's behaviors. So if while I was monitoring and evaluating myself while I was reading and I realized, wow, I just read that whole page and I have no idea what it's talking about, then directing and regulating would be, hmm, I think I'm going to reread it and maybe look up some words while I do it. Make sense? So these are three kind of the three crucial components of the metacognitive process. All right, so let's get meta for a second. What are some ways that you feel like you are metacognitively, metacognitively aware when it comes to your own learning and thinking? You know, I will say, for instance, when I was in grad school and I was working on my dissertation, I felt like I did a pretty good job of being metacognitive, metacognitively aware of the fact that I did my best work in terms of writing um, from around 10 a.m. to around 3 p.m. Um, and I would stop my work by 5 p.m. because I knew that after that, I wasn't getting any quality work done. And that worked pretty well for me. So what are some ways that you feel like you are metacognitively aware about yourself? listening to a lecture, taking notes, and then referring to the textbook. That's great. How would this sound to a reader or a listener? That's great, yeah, absolutely. How can I apply this new knowledge to my lectures? That's a great one, Chris. Knowing when to ask questions, yeah. That's a really important one, I think. Taking breaks, yes, also really important. Knowing I have to write my own notes first, yeah. Type up my notes from class. Yeah, you know, I, my mom used to do that. She would tell me about that. Knowing how to take notes. Y'all, I could geek out about note-taking anytime. So if you ever wanna have a conversation with me about that, just let me know. Drawing is knowing, I like that one. Knowing to allow an incubation period between drafts, yeah. That's a really good one. Yeah, another one for me, I, I had a, a realization in grad school as well that I could never just get something done the night before it was due. Not that we should do that, but my best friend in grad school could write a brilliant paper the night before it was due. I had to start weeks in advance and then draw, write an outline and get all my research done. And it was a whole process for me. Yeah. So yeah, that, um, no, oh, I'd love to personal how students help no, take notes. That's good to know, Nancy. I might do that because I love talking about note-taking. Reading before class, keeping a list. Yeah, these are great. <laughs> Thank you. I always wish that I could write that paper the night before like my best friend, but I just couldn't even stay up that late, quite frankly. That's what it came down to. So good, we have some, y'all are some amazingly metacognitively aware people. So that means you're gonna be great at helping your students become more metacognitively aware. All right, so let's take a quick look at one very simplified example of what a complete metacognitive cycle might look like for one very self-aware student. Um, so say that you're a student who is working on a big project and you're not my friend who can do everything the night before. So again, obviously many of our students are not gonna be um, this metacognitively skilled, but this is what, if they were, this is the way the whole cycle might look like, right? So starting with awareness, say you're the student, you realize I'm most productive and able to focus on work in the mornings. So we move to the planning process and that might be, okay, so I don't have class on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. So I'm gonna set aside time specifically on those mornings to work on this big semester long project. Monitoring piece comes in. 
okay, so I'm going to try this for a week, see how it goes, see how much I get done and whether it's really working the way I, I want it to. I'll evaluate it, right? So evaluation piece. Gosh, I thought this was going to work really well, but I keep getting distracted by social media while I'm working. So they make a decision. Okay, so I'm going to allow myself 30 minutes at the beginning of the day to check all my accounts. And then I'm going to turn off alerts for the rest of the morning so I don't get distracted. Again, I don't know if any college student might actually do this, but this is just an example, right? Um, so my goal for the next part of the session then is to think about how we can help equip our students with the skills and more importantly, the inclination to engage in this process that we're looking at right now. Um, if any of you came to or watched um, my webinar on critical thinking, fostering critical thinking, during that session, I talked about cultivating a critical spirit in our students, helping them kind of adopt this practice as a habit. And it's kind of the same idea here, right? We wanna help our students just make this part of their daily lives. This is just what they're always gonna do. So next question I have for you, where do you think your students might get stuck in this particular process of metacognition? If you have any ideas about this, what are your thoughts? What do you think they might struggle with? Yeah, just that awareness piece to begin with. Distractions, yeah. <laughs> the phone. Planning, planning and directing. They overestimate their skills and underestimate college level grading. I think you make a really good point. Activation energy just to get things done. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of our students are going to get stuck on that just awareness piece. Like they may not even be, they might not even be thinking about any of this. It doesn't even enter their radar. And then as some of you are mentioning, they might get further along in the process, but fail to initiate that planning piece or um, the directing piece, right? Maybe they have a realization about what they do, but they don't make any changes to the things that they're doing that are not effective, right? So it might be those things like turning off distractions or managing their time better, um, like some of you are mentioning here, or that idea of multitasking, like they're trying to do too many things at once, and so they're getting stuck in that process. So now let's think about some strategies that might help our students get unstuck in that process. So we're gonna go back to this idea of um, kind of cultivating a met metacognitive spirit rather than a critical spirit, though I would say those two go hand in hand. And think about mindset. So it is important to cultivate a growth mindset in our students. Um, some of you may already be familiar with this um, concept of growth versus performance mindset, or you may have read the work of Carol Dweck um, related to mindset among others. But kind of the upshot here is that the beliefs that students adopt about their own learning and their own brains and their abilities to do things successfully will affect their performance and their motivation. So if they believe their abilities are static or have what's called a fixed mindset, then they will, you know, that's when we have students who think that they just don't get something or they're not good at something. And that's all there is to it, right? You know, you think about those students who might say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not good at math. I just can't do math or I am terrible at English, I can't, I can't do writing, I'm not good at reading. Well, we know that's not true. We know that you can move beyond that. You can learn how to do those things. So we wanna help them get beyond that fixed mindset and adopt a growth mindset that and help them realize that mistakes are okay, that learning is a process, um, that you can change things up and improve things, 
that they can grow, that they can get better at these things. Um, this can be really empowering to them and encourage them, again, to cultivate those metacognitive inclinations and skills um, and think about ultimately how can they do things better? So if they're not coming at say this, this studying process as a way of like, well, you know, I just don't get it. So I'm not gonna try to do anything differently because it's not gonna make a difference. Instead, we want them to think, okay, well, this isn't effective. How can I make it better? So in other words, we have to kind of help create a culture that supports this practice of metacognition. What about instruction? That's why we're all here. What can we do to actually teach these skills to our students? So as I was thinking about this question, while I was putting this session together, I was reminded of an old episode of The Simpsons. I don't know if you all like The Simpsons, if you watch The Simpsons. Um, I happen to be married to someone who I think has seen every episode of The Simpsons ever. Um, but I was reminded of an old episode of The Simpsons where, and I mean really old, like I think I was still a child when this episode aired. Um, in this episode, their house is sinking and they need to do, they need to repair the foundation. Um, so to save money, Homer buys a do-it-yourself video. And again, maybe some of you remember this video. I think uh, this episode, I think it's a pretty, pretty classic one. So Homer buys this do-it-yourself video for foundation repair, starring Troy McClure. You may remember him from such uh, service videos as Designated Drivers, The Life-Saving Nerds, or Phony Tornado Alarms, Reduce Readiness. Um, so Troy McClure is the, the host of this video, and he quickly launches into this fast, jargon-laden overview of the process of foundation repair, um, using words that Homer doesn't understand, talking about things that Homer doesn't know anything about, and ends with the most helpful instruction of all, install. Um, and I don't know about you, but this is what every HGTV show feels like to me a lot of times. So obviously, this does not work for Homer. So what does this have to do with teaching metacognition, you might ask? Well, think of our students as Homer in this particular situation. And we don't want to be Troy McClure, throwing terminology and actions at our students that they just can't follow, right? That they don't understand, that they don't know anything about. So research shows that it pays to be intentional and offer explicit instruction about metacognitive skills, just like it would have been helpful in terms of foundation repair. I don't think that that's a DIY project to begin with. So ultimately what I'm getting at is that we can't assume that our students intuit what we're trying to teach them or demonstrate for them. Just like Homer had no idea what it meant to parge a lath. I don't know what that means either. Instead, we need to be transparent about what metacognition is and what it looks like. Giving our students the terminology and the tools that they need and being very explicit in our instruction as we model it for them, okay? So, I like to think of this like watching a cooking show. So when we watch whatever your favorite show is on the Food Network, if you have one, um, and we're watching um, Alex Grinichelli making a recipe for us, cooking a recipe um, that we're trying to learn how to make, we don't just watch them do it, right? They don't just stand there and put the things in the bowl and put things in the oven. Um, but we also don't just listen to them describe it either. We watch them do both, right? They demonstrate it. They also tell us what they're doing as they do it. So they model the actions they're taking for us as viewers. They're explaining the ingredients, um, describing what they're doing as they go. So basically, this is also what we need to do to help our students acquire metacognitive awareness and skills. 
So first it's imperative, there's that awareness piece, right? That so many of you brought up when we talked about where our students are getting stuck. We have to make our students aware of what those various metacognitive skills and practices and cognitive tasks are that they should be engaging in. Um, we have to help them know the stuff in the first place. They might not have any idea what any of this is. Um, we also want them to understand the importance of these things, like paying attention to their strengths and weaknesses, or providing them with the kinds of questions that they should be asking themselves um, while studying or working on projects or processing something that they're reading. So again, this would be like a chef teaching viewers about the different ways to chop vegetables or how to reduce a sauce. Okay, so we're giving them the, the knowledge, that, that declarative knowledge that they need. So the next piece of this is to actually model these practices for our students so that they know what that metacognitive process looks like in action and how and when to bring those skills into play, right? Um, so there's that procedural and conditional knowledge that we talked about. So again, back to the chef um, analogy. So just like a chef demonstrating the preparation of a specific dish, explaining the thought process behind why um, she chooses to chop the vegetables in this particular way for this particular dish um, versus other ways that one might chop vegetables, right? Why do they choose to make them ch chop the carrots into big chunks versus small rivets, okay? So for instance, if we're bringing this back into our classrooms, you might talk to students through how you think procedurally in solving a problem, how you start, what you decide to do in the first place and why you decide to do that, and then what you decide to do next and why, how you check your work, how you know when you're done, or say it's a writing class. You might model for your students um, how you think about feedback that you've received on a piece of writing and then how you act on that feedback to revise that piece of writing. Okay, so all of these things that students might not already know. They need to see what that process looks like so that they can try it out themselves. So once you've created this culture of growth in the classroom and explicitly taught and modeled, your modeled for your students these metacognitive skills, um, the next step is to give them many, many opportunities to practice those skills themselves. And by opportunities, I don't just mean encouragement, like make sure you think about these things, but I mean actually building in tasks into assignments, into classroom activities, um, kind of forcing them to do these things until they internalize the practice. Um, you know, practice and repetition, I think we all know this, are really crucial components of the learning process. Um, and if you think about it, for instance, dancers or musicians are not created by their teacher simply telling them what dancing look like, looks like and then doing some dancing for them at the front of the class. Those dance students have to actually do it for themselves many, many, many times before they can perfect it. So that's what we need to do for our students. We need to build in these opportunities for them to practice over and over. So what follows, what I'm gonna talk about next are some specific metacognitive tasks that you can think about um, giving to your students to build in this practice for all different um, points along that process, all those different components that we talked about. So reflection. Regular guided reflection. Reflection is always a valuable teaching tool and activity. I think I probably include it in some way in almost every webinar that I do here, um, but it is particularly important when it comes to encouraging and enhancing metacognition in our students. Um, and there are a lot of really wonderful opportunities for building it in. So one thing I wanna point out for you here, you'll notice that it says regular and guided reflection here. And those are two really important descriptors. Regular 
in that it relates to the notion of continuous practice, right? So it's not just a one-off thing. This should be something that they're doing regularly, um, something they're doing frequently so that they can continue to improve. Um, and guided, meaning as instructors, it really behooves us to play a role in shaping their reflection by providing them with specific prompts or questions. We have to help them develop the skill of reflection as well. Um, something that I think is, is really interesting to note is that guided reflection has been shown to be especially useful um, in clinical settings, such as nursing. Um, so for those of you who might teach workforce classes, you might tuck that away. Um, this kind of structure in terms of guiding the reflection um, is also shown to be especially beneficial for less experienced students. So here are a few ways that we might incorporate guided reflection in our classes. Um, first, there are things like think aloud activities, which one student talks about solving a problem while another student records their argument or sits back and observes their argument and then reflects back and identifies the processes that that other student went through as they were solving the problem. And then they can give feedback to each other and think about it. I think that's a really fun, um, a really fun idea. Of course, we have journaling and blogging um, or vlogging or whatever it is the kids are doing these days. Um, this could be a weekly activity. It could be something they do for a few minutes at the start of class every day. That's something that, that I've done and that I love to do in my classes. Um, and you maybe you give them prompts that encourage them to kind of flex those metacognitive um, or critical thinking muscles. So for instance, you could ask questions like, why do you think we did this task in class this week or yesterday? Um, or what insights are you having um, during this class session? What are, what are you thinking about right now in relation to the material? You know, kind of encouraging them to make those connections and, and think about what's going on in their heads. In the handout that I um, emailed to you all this morning with the link, um, I've included a list of sample self questions to promote student metacognition about learning along those axes of planning, monitoring, and evaluating. And these come from a really great article by Kimberly Tanner, and the, the citation is on the list of references for you. But take a look at the handout and you'll see like there's so many great questions. This will be, um, I think, the first table that you see in the handout. Um, Next, guided group discussions, tried and true. Another great variation um, on some of these same practices that we're talking about could be small group format, it could be large group format rather than individual writing. Um, another strategy that I really like is the pause procedure. This works for a lot of different um, objectives. Um, and in terms of metacognition, what it might look like would be um, incorporating pauses throughout a task or throughout a lecture, um, getting students to consciously check their actions. So we might ask them to stop and reflect on, evaluate their activities in the moment, think about their thought processes that they're using, and have them actually label those processes transparently, um, like the ones I talked about modeling earlier. Um, you might ask them to reflect on their current understanding of the concept being discussed. You might ask them to do something like identify differences between two concepts or tasks that they're engaging in or learning about, et cetera. It could look a whole, um, a lot of different ways and adapt it to whatever works for you in your class. Another fantastic, very popular strategy um, are wrapper activities. So a wrapper is an activity that surrounds an assignment or wraps around an assignment, an exam, a lecture, um, or other learning activity, and asks students to answer questions such as, how did you prepare for this assignment? Um, what resources did you use? How much time did you spend? What will you do differently next time? Um, there is 
an example of an exam wrapper at the end of the handout that I emailed to you, along with a link to other different kinds of wrappers that you might look at, um, just to get a sense of the different ways that you might use this. This is another um, strategy that has been shown to be really powerful and in terms of encouraging that awareness piece in students, as well as that planning, um, planning and direction piece that we talked about. All right, are we doing okay so far? Talking a lot. I'm watching the chat. Okay. I'm gonna keep going, but um, let me know in the chat if you have a question and I will get to it. <laughs> All right. All right, so reflection next, frequent self-evaluation. So again, that self-evaluation piece we already talked about, that's, a, that's one of the major components of metacognition. So what are some strategies that we can use um, to encourage this? Diagnostic pretests, kind of like the one we did at the very start of this session where I asked, what do you, what do you know about this? How would you rate your understanding? Um, so in our case, for our students, it might be doing things like surveying our students, um, maybe at the start of a unit um, to discover what are they thinking about a topic prior to us trying to teach them something new. So you might ask them to respond to questions like, what do I already know about this topic that could guide my learning? Um, or what, what do I feel like I need clarification on? So this solves multiple problems here, right? It, it first of all activates their prior knowledge, which is important in helping them connect with the new knowledge that they're about to learn about the topic. And that was something that several people identified in the chat earlier as a place where students would get stuck, right? Not um, knowing, uh, not knowing enough already about the material, but if we can help activate some of that prior knowledge, they're going to get unstuck. Um, and this, again, also facilitates their ability to connect that new, that old knowledge to the new knowledge. Um, this could also be things like homework assignments. It could be an in-class short write. It could be a, like a clicker question, um, a poll everywhere kind of thing. There are all different ways that you could do this. So we have these diagnostic pretests. Guess what? We can also do post tests. These can help kind of close the loop, so to speak, by asking students to kind of compare and contrast, right? Examine um, how they thought about the topic before and how they're thinking differently about that topic now. Um, and then maybe articulate how they went through that transformation from before to after. Um, we also have these tried and true strategies that a lot of you might already do, things like exit tickets or muddiest point activities, um, where you ask students to do something like write briefly about a concept that is still unclear to them, um, maybe from that day's lesson or from an entire unit, um, and why is it still unclear to them? Um, you can also ask them to respond to things like, what, what do you think was the most important concept that we use today? And why do you think that was the most important concept? Um, this is great, again, for getting, getting them to reflect on these things and really evaluate their understanding. Um, also great assessment practice, formative assessment practice for you. Um, you can get a sense of where their understanding is um, and revisit things if they're um, struggling with certain concepts. Um, this could be something that you do weekly. It could be an activity that you do at the end of class, kind of as a routine. Um, other questions that you might ask them could be things like that are similar to what you might ask in a wrapper activity. So what strategies um, for studying worked well for you um, or didn't work well for you, et cetera. Again, it could be anything. Um, another strategy that I read about that I really liked was um, a summary matrix, um, 
peer strategy evaluation matrices. Again, there's an example for you in the handout, which I think will help you get a better understanding of what it is. So this is a matrix that really promotes explicit um, knowledge about various study or reading strategies. The, this, the example that I um, have in the handout is about reading strategies in particular, um, where you might ask your students to try different strategies and then evaluate them um, based on how it worked for them. Um, again, a variety of ways that you could use this. Um, students could fill these matrices out individually. They could fill them out in groups. Um, they can complete each row over the course of an entire semester, over the course of a unit. Um, maybe it's something that you give them a little bit of time to work on each week. Um, again, you can incorporate this in whatever way works best for you. Take a look at the example in the handout, and I think um, that will help kind of get, get a clearer picture of what this might look like. Um, another really tried and true strategy that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is portfolios. Um, portfolios of work that students might submit at the, um, maybe at the midterm or at the end of a semester can be really excellent metacognitive exercises in self-evaluation because you're giving students the opportunity to reflect on their work, um, pick pieces that they find to be really representative, um, and then maybe a reflection piece about how these pieces represent them and how they demonstrate their growth, demonstrate their mastery over the content, etc. So a really nice kind of capstone that also encourages metacognition. So again, the idea behind all of these particular strategies is to get your students not only thinking about what they do, but how successful they have been at doing those things and why. So we talked about knowledge um, and reflection. We talked about self-evaluation. So then let's think about that, that other component, self-regulation and self-direction. Um, so what are some things that we can do to help our students really actively monitor and manage um, the processes of their learning and their thinking? Um, Exam or assignment corrections are a fantastic strategy for this, um, not only for making students um, aware of the right answers if it's an exam correction um, or a better understanding of theories or concepts, you know, figuring out what they got wrong, but again, it's also a really useful strategy for helping them learn how to self-correct and regulate their approaches to these things. So beyond simply asking students to just find the correct answers. Um, for instance, you might ask them to also reflect on why they think they missed the questions that they missed. Um, or you might ask them to reflect on the feedback that you've given them on a particular assignment. Maybe it's a paper, maybe it's a project, um, summarizing how they feel about their grade um, and how they might revise it based on that feedback. How are they going to take that feedback and work with it next time? Um, goal setting is another really interesting one that can be a great tool for encouraging that growth mindset that we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, so the idea here is to help students identify a target for their work beyond simply, you know, getting a good grade. Um, for example, at the start of the semester, you might prompt your students to consider why they're taking your course beyond you know, it's required or I was told I have to. Um, and what their ultimate goal is, whether it's for taking this course or being in college, how they plan to achieve it. So make, you could make this a goal that they return to frequently throughout the class and maybe assess their progress towards it. Um, you could have students track their progress in some way. Maybe it's keeping a log of quiz grades um, or successes in a certain lab task over time. Um, and then if they're not making the progress that they would like, then give them an opportunity to reflect on how to change that course of action towards that bigger goal that they identified. Um, some similar things, um, asking students to generate a pros and cons list about their study methods or reading practices um, could be a really fruitful activity in terms of 
self-regulation and self-direction. Um, similarly, um, you could give them this, what's called a regulatory checklist, um, asking them to reflect on, write about their behaviors in terms of planning, monitoring, and evaluating in relation to a task. Again, there's an uh, example in your handout that gives some prompts. Um, I think it's in a table format, but you could make it um, a more narrative format if you want. And you can adapt to these things however you would like. Um, another idea that I really like is group questioning and problem solving. So what this means is rather than a student immediately asking you as their instructor um, a question about something, um, about solving a problem, if it's a math class, um, instead they have to ask their group members first or ask the entire class first before you respond. Um, this, this can be especially fruitful if they're working on, say, a problem that's really difficult to solve or um, an ill-defined problem in a case study or something that they're trying to work through. Um, so the idea here is to encourage students to direct their own learning process rather than just relying on you to tell them what to do. They need to do some of their own problem solving first before you jump in and correct for them. They need to regulate themselves. So kind of similar to this is this idea of requiring students to seek specific feedback from you. Um, and so by this, I mean putting the onus on students when it comes to receiving formative feedback. So maybe it's on a draft of an essay that they're writing um, or a project or a practice test or something like that. Um, so instead of them say, just giving you the draft of the essay and then you writing some feedback on it based on what you see and giving it to them, instead you might require them to submit the draft to you, but with three specific questions that they want you to answer or three components or whatever. I'm just adding a number to that. Um, things that they specifically identify for you to give them feedback on. Like, for instance, um, is my thesis statement strong enough? Or how do you feel about the organization of this essay? Or um, does this paragraph makes sense in these ways. Like it could be anything again, but that idea of them having to think about it first um, and generate the fo focus of the feedback rather than just sitting, them submitting it to you and just getting whatever feedback you give them, that puts the onus on you rather than on them. So by requiring some specific feedback, this is putting the onus on them to really regulate how they're working on it and to think critically about their own work. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the only type of formative feedback that you might give your students, but it could be a really valuable exercise to incorporate at some point. So just some things to think about. The idea here is not to do all of these things, um, but to pick and choose. And maybe there's one or two things from this list um, that might be really interesting to incorporate at some point. So we have a few minutes left. We're gonna get meta again about ourselves. So I have a few questions for you here that I want you to think about. What information has resonated with you the most so far? What are some things that you can see applying in your own teaching context to promote student success? If you have an idea, pop it into the chat. Exam corrections. Yeah. I, I, that's one that I really like that I think could be so powerful. Student guided feedback. And if, if you all do some of these things and try them out in your class, I would love to hear about it, by the way. I'd love to hear how it goes. Submitting drafts with specific questions. Guided self-reflection. Yeah, that idea of, of um, students asking for specific feedback, I think is, is really interesting, could be really powerful. 
so this, so, you know, we're kind of getting at this question already. What one new thing will you try to help promote these things? And then my last question for you here, what do you feel like you want to learn more about? We've just kind of scratched the surface today. This is obviously a huge topic. So what else do you want to learn more about? What else do you want to um, read about? And what questions do you have right now before we wrap it up? Because I just talked for a really long time and I'd love um, to hear from you guys if you have any anything you want to dig into more deeply. Well, I encourage you to take a look at all of the things that are on the handout. There are several examples. There are some other resources and references listed as well if you want to read a little bit more. Um, if you do have any questions after we say goodbye today, um, after you've had a chance to process some of this a little bit more and think about it, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you know, I love talking about this stuff, so I'm glad to talk about it with you more. Um, but I hope that this session has helped you identify some new ideas to implement or help you get a better understanding of what, what metacognition is to begin with. Um, and if nothing else, just get you thinking about thinking a little bit more. Um, again, please feel free to reach out to me at any time and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I hope to see you at some more CTL webinars this spring. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Allison. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, okay. Gloria. Copious notes. <laughs> Good. <laughs>